so we've been looking at a series called The Resurrection Factor. This morning, in this series, we're going to consider resurrection life. We might have different views of what the Bible teaches, but fundamentally the question we individually need to address is not do we have eternal life, but where will we spend it? Uh, Matthew 25, 46 speaks about such issues. Jesus has been asked about what will happen when we die, and he uses a series of stories to illustrate the truth of heaven and hell. He points out that the different destinations will be based on people's individual response to his offer to forgive their sins, that is, their wrongdoings. Uh, We all, as humans, do. There are two possible destinations, Jesus says, depending solely on our response to him. So in Matthew 25, 46, he said, then they, that is, those that have failed to address the wrong in their own lives, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There is no alternative. There's no middle way. There's no stopping off point. There's no place that you go until you've given a second choice. You have to choose in the here and now what you're going to be doing for eternity. The truth is we all have eternal life. But where are you going to spend yours? Now, if you're feeling a bit under pressure today, if that's a bit stark for you, if that's not the sort of thing you thought you were coming to today, then then I apologise. But it would be unfair and a lie if I told you anything different. So what's in question here is are we going to follow Jesus and experience new life here and throughout eternity or not? Hearing who God is and what he's done. And our reading clearly tells us in verse uh, 24. So this is John 5:24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. There might be two questions pop into your mind. It might be, well, who's going to judge me? Uh, Who's going to do the judging? And the other question that might be popping into your mind is, on what basis are we going to be judged? You say, there's going to be judgment, Pete, and we're all going to be judged. Well, who's going to do it, and on what basis are they going to do it? It's only fair that we know before we get there. Well, fortunately, John 5.22 tells us exactly. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to his Son. Notice that just hearing is not good enough, but we need to believe and live in the eternal reality of that belief. We need to know and do. It's not just head knowledge that's a question, it's something more that's needed. 1 Peter 2, chapter 21 says, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you follow in his footsteps. Peter's writing to a church under pressure. He's writing to believers who are knowing that they've given their lives to Jesus, but are suffering. They're having difficulties. And he's writing to them and saying, this is your calling. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And that's a a wonderful example. Whatever you might think about Jesus, 
it has to be true that all we know about him shows us that he was and is a wonderful example to follow. If you wandered out onto the streets of Cow Plain this morning and you hung about in places where you might find people, perhaps the news agents or I don't know what else is open in Cow Plain on a Sunday morning, because I'm always here. And you ask people, what do you think of Jesus? You'd be hard pushed to find anyone who's got anything bad to say. But it's at what level that good that they see in him goes. And it can't just be head knowledge, it has to be more. Peter goes on to explain a bit further on in the letter, 1 Peter 4, 5. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. When this world finishes for us individually and we move into eternity forever, an account of our lives is going to be given. Things that we've long forgotten. Things that we... We hardly knew we'd done, perhaps. An account is going to be looked at. And so Jesus is still the judge and the giver of life. So our question needs to be, are we individually dead in sin or alive through faith? Dead in sin or alive in faith? And for many of us this morning, we know. If not all of us this morning, we know. It's a bit stark. It's a bit oh, hard going on a Sunday morning at 22 minutes to 10. But I don't know how much longer I have in this part of my life, on this earth. I might be helping somebody park up on the front of the church this morning and get run down by them. This might be the last time you see me. I don't know and you don't know. So the question of what comes next is vitally important for each and every one of us. In our reading, in verse 25, it said, Verily, verily, very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. We therefore have to accept, first of all, that we all do wrong. And if you're sitting there smugly this morning saying, Well, I'm a believer, I've been a believer for 22 years, I don't sin anymore. Well, you're not telling the truth. Because we all do wrong things. We all say wrong things. We all think wrong things. And perhaps you're sitting there, sitting next to a Christian that you've known for a long time and thinking, oh, I wish I was as holy as they were. I wish I went to a prayer meeting as often as they did. They're probably sitting there thinking, I'm glad people don't know what it is that goes through my mind, especially when people are warbling on at the front of the church. There is going to be a judgment. There is going to be a judge. There is going to be all of those things taken into account. You see, we all fall short of even our own expectations. let alone the infinitely higher expectations of a holy God. We all need help to put things right. As a young man at home, a very young man at home, I thought I could fix anything. I would uh, get my super glue out, and it wasn't called super glue in those days. It was called um, something cement, wasn't it? Uh, I could fix anything with my cement. With my little tube of glue, I'd go around fixing. Oh, that vase looks a bit vulnerable standing on the edge of that shelf. I think I'll glue it on. (coughs) 
Not only were my parents not pleased that their favourite vase was now stuck in place, and either the shelf would have to be removed from it, or it from the shelf causing damage to one or other or both, but I couldn't do anything to put that error right. I made helpful suggestions about the hammer in the shed that I could go and get, or the saw in the garage that I could use, but we come to some compromise and both the shed and the vase disappeared in the fullness of time. But we all need help to put things right. Ephesians 2 and verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The perhaps unpalatable truth is that we are all, whatever efforts we might make to pretend otherwise, are wrongdoers in thought and word and action. We all need help. And before you look down your row and think, yeah, I can see they need help, or you sit next to your loved one next door and think, hmm, after this little chat we had this morning, they certainly need help. We all need help. Romans 14, 9 says, For this very reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. That's why he came. He came to be Lord of all. Lord of those that live and Lord that of those that have passed away. Lord of all. Jesus has the authority to judge. We said it was one of those key questions. The authority to judge. Our reading said in verses 26 and 27, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and has given him the authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. We have to acknowledge that God has done all in his power to help us out of the enormous difficulties we have put ourselves in as human beings. We all willfully break God's rules every day. We lie and cheat. We are unkind, unloving, and uncaring. And if you want to take issue with me about any of those, come and see me at the end. Let me talk to your family and friends, your work colleagues, and those around you, and I'm sure, even if you don't recognise those things in your own life, they will readily help me. He has set the rules, but rather than being weak and changing his plans for us, he met us in our need and provided us the answer that we needed. You see, God wouldn't be God if he set standards and then changed them because he found those standards weren't being met. You wouldn't expect the people who look after our health and well-being to change the standards of safety just because they're a bit difficult to keep. We'll change the standards of the brakes on people's cars because they don't really want to change their brake discs quite so often as they're having to change them. What a disaster that would be. There have to be rules and regulations. There have to be things in place. You see, we live in a world that understands justice. You go and talk to people, they understand that if you do wrong and you get caught, you get punished. They understand that. That's not foreign to any human being, particularly if it's other people that are doing the wrong. They sometimes might think that things are a bit harsh if it's them doing wrong, but generally, if they're talking about other people, they understand that if you do wrong, you get caught, you get punished. And we have a God who knows everything about us, who sees the wrong, 
and therefore needs to do something about it. But we somehow think that we can hide the truth and escape from our just, pun just punishment. But God knows about it. God knows about it. It's amazing, isn't it, again, as children, how if something accidentally broke while we were handling it, not mum's vase, because of course that was perfectly safe from then on, we think that we could put it in the bottom of the dustbin, cover it with a few other articles, and pretend it never happened. Some of you are looking very blankly at me as if you never did that sort of thing. Perhaps it was only me who lived that sort of life. But God knows all things. He's with us in our times of joy and happiness. He's with us in our dark times. He's with us in those times that we really wished nobody else would know what it is we were doing or thinking. And he will act. He will act. Acts chapter 17 reminds us, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this through to everyone by raising him from the dead. There's a time of judgment coming. And if we live that long, that will be the time when God judges us. And if we die beforehand, that will be the time when God will judge us. He knows and he will act. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the hearts. My poor parents, I had two sisters, and would constantly blame either one of them for anything that went wrong. It was great. They didn't know. But God knows everything. He not only knows everything we do and think and say, but he knows the motivation. He knows why we did it. But Jesus has come and has died for us, each of us, individually, as the only way to help out. Romans 8 says, There is now, therefore now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you know him and love him and have trusted him to be your saviour, to save you from the judgment that your own wrongdoings justly deserve, then he will do that. We are saved from this great judgment because the penalty for the wrong we do has already been settled. It's already been sorted out. We just need to trust. Lord Jesus did it for us personally. We need to confess him as Lord and Saviour and live in the light of him being our Lord and Saviour. You see, judgment is coming. It might have taken rather a long time. 2,000 years ago, the disciples expected it to be any day, any moment of any day. And 2,000 years later, we're still waiting, but it is coming. Verses 28 and 29 of our reading says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to condemnation. There's going to be a reckoning for each of us in the room this morning. And not just each of us because we've heard the message this morning, but each of the people walking past the church this morning. 
each of the people doing their shopping in Waterlooville today, or the ones down in Portsmouth, the ones in America, China, wherever in the world they are, there is a time of judgment coming. But each and every one of them has a problem. As we've already said, we cannot do the good things that we'd need to do to make it right for us individually. So we need to commit ourselves into the care of one who can and does make things right for us. Even from the beginning of time, this inevitable judgment has been anticipated. You see, over 2,600 years ago, a man called Daniel, a refugee in a foreign country, wrote this. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel hadn't heard of Jesus. Daniel hadn't seen God work in that way. He was, knew God to be a righteous God, a God who would judge fairly. And David, a, a king who understood his own faults and failings, wrote these words. In Psalm 68, our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign law comes escape from death. And David's not talking about the death in this life because he understood, like we all understand, that this life will end. David's talking about a, a saving from the death to come. A death that involves being separated from that loving Heavenly Father forever. A death that means all the things that on earth that are good and wonderful because God is working here still through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be taken away. He's talking about a death excluded from God's presence where human beings reach the very pit of behaviour. Some of the things we see on our television cause us to worry about human nature. The things that men and women are prepared to do to one another. Either directly or indirectly. The pain and the difficulty they cause. The horror of what they cause to happen. But the pain after this life, as we move to the next, will be infinitely worse and without end. Again, in John it says, there is a judge for those who reject me and do not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on that last day. He's saying, look, I've given everybody an opportunity. Everybody will have the opportunity to hear the message of the Son of Man, the Son of God coming to die for humanity. To take away the punishment that they each and every one deserve. And if they don't respond, then there's no more I can do. In the days of the early church, soon after Jesus died, some 2,000 years ago, some malicious people made false claims. Recorded for us in Timothy, it says, they say that resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. There were some going around that saying, well, yes, the, the really holy ones have already gone to be with God, so you lot clearly are those that have been left, that God didn't want, that you've been rejected, that you're not good enough. They sought to bring disquiet to those who believed. They sought to bring confusion to those that were considering faith. 
but Ephesians 2 and 10 verses, I apologise for the length of the passages I've chosen, says these things. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's how we all start. Because of the world in which we live and our situation, that's how we all start. We're born in that sad situation in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. That might not be apparent to those of us that are believers already, but that's already what's prepared for us. That's already our privileged position, seated with Christ. in order that the, in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works. It's not something we can do to make it happen. It's not something that we have a program that we need to follow in order to get there. It's not a, a checklist, daily or weekly, I need to visit sick people. I need to show love and care. I need to drop money in the collection. It's not by works. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. As those of us that know the Lord Jesus as our personal Lord and Saviour, and we wait in this present world for the time when we're going to be fully in his presence, when this world finishes and we move on to eternity to come, there are things that we can do. There are things that we have to do. There's things that we should do in sharing that good news with those around us, in encouraging those around us to help them understand, to do good works, to meet people in their needs, to help and encourage one another. There's things that we're expected to do. Those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Saviour, we have such a tremendous privilege. We need to challenge ourselves as to how it is we're going to use those gifts and abilities. We're going to use the time that God's given us here on earth to share that good news with those around us. And it might be that you've tried. It might be that you've told people Perhaps the people that you've told a number of times need showing in acts of love, in acts of giving, in acts of encouragement. So we can, not only as believers in God, our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, His only Son, enjoy His provision for us, but we can also look forward to an eternal peace with him when we pass into eternity, into the eternity to come. Who spent time with you? Who shared the gospel with you? What was it in your life, if you are a believer, that suddenly the lights came on and it was as if all the stuff that you thought you knew suddenly fell into place.
Who was it that shared with you, spent time with you, prayed for you? Do you know that person? Or was it somebody in the background that you were never quite sure? We have a responsibility, those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Saviour, to be those sort of people for others. Encouraging, challenging sometimes. Living lives so that others understand what it is to be a Christian in this day and age. But as those of us that are looking forward to an eternity in God's presence, wait for our time to go and be with him for that eternity. There are ways in which we need to live our lives here. Living here with God means that we can live at peace with him. As you watch your friends and neighbours scrabbling around, hassled about this and that and the other. Not in just enjoy the peace for yourself, but share some of that peace with them too. We can serve God by reaching out to others in love. His love for us, shared with them. We can have that peace, we can enjoy that love, we can share those but we can know also the joy of knowing our faults and failings are forgiven and forgotten by our loving Heavenly Father. If you are a believer this morning, if at some time in your past you have got to that point where you've realised that you are a sinner and however hard you worked, you were never going to get it right, You've reached that point where you've said to God, look, I I can't do this. It's all too much for me. I understand that I cannot do it. Thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ to die for me. Thank you that through his death and resurrection, my sins, my wrongdoings, my wrong thoughts and actions and words are just wiped away for eternity and my place with you is secured if you've done those things then as we share communion in a few moments rejoice in what's been done for you and with you and in you if you're with us this morning and it's was quite amusing to start with but suddenly it's got very serious If you're not sure what it means and you've been before and heard the words but you're not sure whether you've really done whatever it is you need to do to make it real for you, then as we share a time of communion, just sit quietly. Ask God to explain it to you and show you. If you've come with a friend who keeps inviting you but you're not quite sure why. You've enjoyed the singing and you've enjoyed the people that are here, but you're not really sure, then speak to them before you go. Ask them what it really means to them to be part of God's church, not just here in Cow Plain, but universally and eternally. Question them. Ask them about their... (coughs) experience of knowing God and as we have a time of communion sit quietly if you're here alone this morning you've just wandered in or you you come on a regular basis but you you don't really know whether you have faith or not you don't know really whether God loves you or not and, and you're not sitting with anyone you can really talk to about it then please Take time before you leave us to talk to someone, somebody at the door, one of the stewards, some, one of the musicians, and just ask them, 
please don't know this morning before knowing and enjoying God's presence in your life. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that as you created the world and it was perfect, just the way you wanted it, and then you watched as things got worse and worse, as first of all your very created beings, Adam and Eve, and then through the generations our world became more and more and more dirty and hateful, disgusting. We thank you that you did all that you could, all that was needed, so that each one of us could know you as our loving Heavenly Father. You sent Jesus, who willingly came, your only Son, to die on a cross, pay the punishment of the things that we so easily do. We thank you that he rose again to show each and every one of us that there is a plan and a purpose and a hope for each of us. We pray that you'd help those of us that know you to be convinced enough to tell others and help those of us who are unsure know with certainty that there is a place for them too in your kingdom beyond this world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.